Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now we'll be diving into a very interesting topic, the development and manufacturing of biosimilars and biotherapeutics. To start this session, it's my pleasure to welcome the chairman of the session, Dr. Joshua Laber, executive director of the Biodesign Institute. Welcome, Dr. Joshua. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. Well, good morning for me. For you all, uh, you're at various time zones, I suppose. It's good So here in Arizona, it's 7 a.m. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, um, uh, uh, to this um, biotechnology, te medical biotechnology summit. Um, and as you just heard, um, today we're going to be focusing um, in our session on biosimilars and biotherapeutics. Um, and we have an outstanding lineup of people to speak today. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Dr. Hiep Tran, uh, who is currently the President and Chief Scientific Officer of Abzyme Therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Tran obtained his PhD in, in 1992 at the Molecular Genetics at uh, Department of Genetics in St. Petersburg State University in Russia. Um, he, he has served over the years at Rockland Immunochemicals and, at, and then co-founded Abzyme Therapeutics. Uh, and has more than 25 years of academic and industrial experience and uh, evidently still enjoys going into the lab, which is very cool. So I will hand it over to him and his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me try to my slide. Can I show slide up? Okay. Um, yes, so um, my topic talk today is a natural gamelite single domain antibody as an alternative for the next generation immunotherapy. Um, so my company is uh, located outside Philadelphia. Um, so uh, my talk today has three parts. First part is uh, overview the current status of single domain antibody in immunotherapy. Uh, second part will be overview the platform we use here for antibody development. And third part will be example of uh, development of antibody for two target. Um, so my talk is a very pure science, so please bear with me. Uh, so as you know that uh, the Carmelite, Carmel, Lama, Alpaca is it's, it's offer something that we and other animals do not have, that is uh, the IgG antibody lack of light chains. And uh, only other species, shark, have also a single domain antibody, but not IgG. Uh, so also my, my talk today is focused on how uh, single domain antibody derived from uh, common light and apply that to for immunotherapy. So this uh, is a perspective of um, immunotherapy. Um, for monoclonal antibody uh, was uh, Hybridoma platform was discovered in the 90s and uh, uh, only 10 years later that first drug had been approved for immunotherapy. Uh, but the Carmelite antibody was first discovered in early of uh, 90. And uh, three years ago, the first Carmelite antibody developed by Abding Sanofi was approved by FDA for treatment of rare uh, blood clotting disorder. So that was great new. And, and nowadays, actually, the Kamala antibody became kind of fashion and the many uh, company in this slide start to jump in, you know, it's a um, small and big company start to apply for uh, using antibody for different uh, treatment, I mean, in process of development. So why, why Kamala antibody have something that unique to, to them and are not, not present in, in other addition antibody. Uh, first thing that they are very small in size, only 10 to 14 kilodontal, um, very stable in single domain. So you can assembling in multivalent, multi-specific uh, molecule uh, because you have long CDR3, so they can access to a very hidden epitope. Uh, and also normally traditional is not, not ac uh, accessible to uh, IgG. Why it's small, but the affinity uh, is it's relative high. And if you create molecule with bivalent antibody, uh, the binding to the target actually is superior 
to um, traditional IgG antibody. And this slide shows that uh, in the case of uh, anti TNA alpha, the bivalent uh, antibody derived from common light is a much higher binding to the target compared with uh, the Humira. Um, so, because uh, single domain antibody is modular, so you can, can play with them with like Lego. And uh, this is an example of how uh, common light antibody was applied to different strategy for tumor immunotherapy, uh, starting from uh, targeted radio immunotherapy because they have short life and have very, very good tumor penetration to the CAR T and to the direct or uh, make a bite, that means connection with T cell to the cancer cell. So, in this slide, you see a lot of strategy where you can apply the common line antibody uh, for, for treatment of tumor. Okay, so the uh, second part of my talk is the, the platform we use um, to develop common line antibody in, in our company. Uh, so we use, um, first we use, uh, we have the Lama farm here, um, hosting by Roland. So we have Lama alpaca in our facility. Um, because animal, is, it's big, it's, it, you know, it costs more than mouse, so actually for Lama, we humanize not one antigen, but five, 10 antigen. And once Lama humanized, we, we make a East surface display library uh, where the antibody VH8 now is displayed on its cell surface. Um, and used through the fat sorting, um, then we can pull out from billion uh, cell the rare clone which actually interact to your uh, inter uh, antigen of interest. So this flow show that how, how simple the process will be. Normally it takes six months, most time consuming the time for immunized llama because they take four months. But once you have this display library, as everything moving very fast. Uh, so once you have the, the V8, then now you can play with them like a let go. You can fusion with other V8. You can fusion with IgG at antimon or cytomenon and use, you can express them and uh, produce like a multi-specific, multivalent antibody. And this example that they are very well expressed, easy to purify it. Okay. So the take home message of, of, of uh, the system here, because we use the East surface display, that eukaryote system, so it can um, pre-select the well express, well soluble, um, uh, the protein that very important for downstream manufacturing. Um, also because of fat sorting, so you can pull out the very rare clone from, from million, million of possibility. And during fat sorting, you can incorporate, incorporate different attributes for sorting, like I will uh, tell downstream later that uh, you can select, like uh, not only react to human antigen, but react with mouse and uh, rat or uh, other species. That's very, very important because downstream, you want to uh, have uh, cross-reactivity with other targets, so you can use for um, testing in an other animal model. Um, because of one animal, we can immunize uh, many antigens same time. So uh, in, in our company, we, we cover a lot of target. Uh, this only showed that four llama we immunize, but we, we now we move like our own term, like llama number 13. So we cover in more than 100 target of, uh, for different disease indication. Okay, so now I go to more specific that how we leverage the, our platform for develop kind of nanobody. Uh, so before us, it's a one of target that uh, we would like to develop kind of nanobody which can act as agonist, uh, can stimulate the nerve flow. Uh, so to reverse process of uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, so in this case, it's actually try to create agonists uh, similar like to uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, Brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor uh, is a neuro uh, growth factor, but cannot use therapeutic because uh, they're hydrophobic and not very good uh, 
cannot re- cannot be properly. Um, so what we do that we immunize the receptor to the llama, make library, go through the fat sorting, and isolate clone. And uh, once you have the each cell, you can play it on the agar plate. You have single colony, and now you pick up colony, and you validate one by one to see that actually confirm again that the each cell, uh, each cell, it's a display the VH antibody and specific your target, um, and uh, confirm again that actually um, your antibody is reactive to the rat and the rabbit um, homologous protein, so downstream when you use a rat or rabbit more than actually you have seen the effect because if they do not cross react with a rat or a rabbit target, then it's no way you can, can validate the therapeutic efficacy. So in order to show that uh, this uh, nanobody is acting as an agonist, actually acting as a nerve growth factor, so we have the cellular base system where the, if the nanobody binds to the receptor, then they stimulate downstream signal pathway and actually turn on the, the transcription of reporter gene. Uh, so from in our screening, uh, so from billion of cells, we narrow to fat sorting and finally we pick up 200 each clone analyzed and from 200, we identify eight clones actually have uh, not simply cross-reactive with a human, rat, and rabbit um, target, but also have the antagonist uh, agonist activity. That means turn on the, 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 the reporter system in some way to say. Okay, this is like a, this slide summarize of, of process actually from starting from billion of cells and how, how many agonists we identify uh, after screening. And uh, because each step of fat sorting, you can store the each cell at the minus, 20, uh, minus 80 degrees. So uh, you always can come back and you need more, you can screen more the clone out. Okay, so, so that the first is um, the try to identify the agonist can stimulate the nerve row. Um, uh, and uh, now we go to other target actually is try to uh, cool down the, uh, the inflammation because uh, uh, we will have project to try to cure the blindness in human. That's one side uh, blocking the inflammation in the eye and other side stimulate the nerve growth in the eye so can, can prevent the blindness of, of, of own people. Okay. So this uh, second target is it, uh, uh, blocking the problem Complement pathway. So in, in human, it's complement pathway is it, it's an innate immune system defense uh, to. Uh, okay, so this normally it it, uh, it the defense system, but when they overreact or disorder, and it, it can cause a lot of disease. So on the left side of, of slide, you can see that number of human disease is related to to uh, disorder in, in complement. Pathway where you need to uh, need drug to intervene uh, with system to to uh, for uh, disease treatment. And uh, on the right side, actually, that um, relate to very good review. And actually, a lot of uh, data now accumulate to show that actually people in uh, dying from COVID is not due to viral infection, but but because uh, overreactive of the immune system response. Uh, so, we, because the uh, uh, complement pathway is the first, first response, uh, and uh, so they can, can if be overreactive, then can cause um, the organ failure. Uh, so, a lot of company now that they try to do, um, use certain drug block complement pathway, try to testing uh, and they prevent the organ failure in the COVID patient. Um, but, but the drug testing right now is a C5 and C3 inhibitor, and our drug is a more upstream uh, C, C1Q inhibitor. Um, so how, how can we identify the, the inhibitor um, of the C1Q? Um, 
So one I mentioned before that the, the nanobodies, it's unique because they are small size, so they can uh, access to certain uh, epitope which is hidden, it's like an enzymatic active site. It's normally classic antibody cannot block. So, but nanobody is like a chemical, so they can, can get inside and block it. And, and actually, um, we, we are successful to identify the nanobody actually block the whole enzymatic pathway or classic uh, complementary pathway. Um, so it, uh, the, the, the target itself is even huge, so we have to screen a lot of uh, uh, the candidate to finally identify the clone actually really block the enzymatic activity of the uh, C1Q. Uh, the, the, our the say of screening is uh, once we have the binder, then we screen express in E. coli, purify um, the nanobody and start to testing for uh, hemolytic uh, assay, which uh, use a uh, sheep red blood cell, uh, lysis mediated by anti red uh, blood cell. And uh, if, if uh, the antibody block the reaction, then actually. Uh, no hemoglobin released to the, the, uh, to the media, to the solution. So you can see that the color will be white. If the uh, red blood cell lies, then uh, the, the wear will be blood red. Uh, so we identify one really strong clone uh, called um, ABZ194 and compare with the uh, other, uh, the bleeding candidate of uh, C1Q blocker uh, based on IgG and our antibody is much, much stronger. Um, so, so now we want to create kind of uh, biotherapeutic actually have two properties. One side is uh, stimulate the nerve growth and other side is uh, in blocking the, the C1Q uh, complement pathway. So we make a tetrameric bispecific uh, fusion antibody, uh, which actually very, uh, as I mentioned before, they drink easy to express even in E. coli, not talking about mammon cell. And then this slide that once we fusion, we produce um, the, the tetrameric bispecific antibody, then you want to be sure that they still retain the property uh, for the original of antibody. And then this slide show that yes, for target A, they still stimulate the, the signal transduction uh, reporter system, and as positive control, we use the BDNF as uh, the neuron factor, uh, and actually they are much stronger uh, compared to the natural uh, neuron factor. And uh, also for blocking the uh, C1Q, that the activity retained uh, in the theta, the, the theta meric uh, bispectric uh, format. So what we're doing right now, that actually because this project uh, collaborates with uh, the Sun and ophthalmology in Japan, so we pass this uh, to, to, to them. So they're testing in rabbit and uh, rat more than for, for eye disease, open sclerosis, that kind of uh, neurodegenerative disease caused by immune system. So we, we have now working on the uh, mouse model and uh, uh, hopefully that this drug will slow down the, the disease in the mice. Uh, you know, one side and uh, stimulate the nerve growth. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think I will stop here that uh, I, it's, it's, we have small biotech company, around 10 people. It's kind of international team. Uh, myself is a Vietnamese born, but educate Russia, I train US, and uh, Steve is uh, American born, but Fuad from Siri. Uh, Yang Li come from Korea and uh, to other scientists from India. So we, we, we kind of example of intention collaboration here. You know, it's uh, our goal is try to develop kind of antibody or therapeutic actually once we got have hopefully leave some impact to the world. Um, so I, I stop my, my talk here and uh, I would be glad to have any questions from you. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, as you all know, we're going to have a panel discussion a little bit later, so there will be time for more deep discussion. But if there are immediate questions that anybody has, please put them in the chat below. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I will very quickly ask the question. Um, yeah. uh, uh, 
so how much variation do you see when you try to make antibodies against a particular target? Is, is it, you know, a very polyclonal response or do you end up with just a few or how does that? Okay, the diversity of the clone when we, you obtain is very dependent on the, your target size. Okay. So, uh -huh. so like C C1Q is a 400 kilodontone and when we put out uh, from 200 clones, we have like a, four, a 52 family different. Uh, but but for for the track B, which actually are the target, there are only 40 kilodontons around that side. And uh, we put out only eight family. Uh, and for other target, like a VGF, very small uh, uh, protein, actually you get like three family. So it's it, it dependent on the size of your target. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on, I see. Um, no, no more questions in the chat, so I will go ahead. Um, I'm, I think I am the next speaker here, so I will briefly introduce myself. I'm Joshua LeBaire. I'm the Executive Director at the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. My background, I did um, uh, both an MD-PhD at UCSF and then uh, specialized in medical oncology through my clinical training and have been largely a cancer researcher. Um, my uh, Particular interest is using um, the display of proteins in a fashion to allow the development of diagnostics for early detection of disease. And you'll hear a little bit about that uh, momentarily. Um, I started the Harvard Institute of Proteomics for many years and then have since been recruited out to ASU where um, I have a center in personalized diagnostics and where I run the institute. So let me um, uh, talk about uh, my presentation uh, called New Methods for Cell-Free Presentation of Proteins for Functional Analysis. Let's see how the, how the, yep, yeah, that's working. So this is just um, to remind you that um, I'm going to be talking about breast cancer, which is the, um, uh, in, in the last year, is still a leading cause of uh, cancer in women and the number two leading cause of cancer deaths in women. And um, uh, one, one element of breast cancer that we are familiar with is that the earlier we detect the disease, the better likelihood we have of intervening and having a positive outcome. And this is basically survival based on stage. And as you can see, early stage diseases on the left there do very well, but the later we detect the disease, the worse the outcome. So um, my lab and others are interested in developing ways to detect the disease. Now, of course, there's a very excellent method for detecting the disease. That is mammography. Um, it is uh, very helpful. Uh, but it's not perfect. Um, it misses up to 25% of cancers, depending on um, the methodology used. And around 80% of findings by mammography are false positives, which means a lot of unnecessary surgeries and a lot of uh, very concerned women um, who don't necessarily need to be. So we and others have hoped for the idea of developing a blood test that could be used in com as a companion to mammography to improve both the sensitivity of uh, the detection and also improve the specificity. And the approach that we are taking is, you know, is to exploit uh, antibodies. So as you all know, um, normal cells in the body undergo cell death at various times, or they secrete proteins in the bloodstream, but our immune systems largely ignore um, self proteins for good reason. We don't wanna be constantly attacking ourselves. But in the context of cancer, um, cancer cells make aberrant proteins or make aberrant amounts of certain proteins. And when those proteins end up in the bloodstream, they do induce antibodies. Uh, and these antibodies uh, are often referred to as tumor-associated antibodies or tumor antigen-associated antibodies. And they have some characteristics that make them good tools for uh, biomarker detection. In a sense, they amplify the signal. As you can imagine, a very small cancer uh, one that's not even detectable, let's say, by mammography or by CT scan, um, is going to make very small amounts of aberrant protein. Uh, but once those proteins induce antibodies, the amount of antibody is much higher than the antigen itself. And even if the antigen itself gets cleared from the bloodstream, the antibodies persist. Uh, moreover, it's relatively easy to detect antibodies. And so for that reason, we're interested in using these antibodies to cancer proteins as a way of detecting the cancer themselves. Um, now, how, how do we detect antibodies? Well, the classic method um, is the ELISA assay, where you coat the wells of a dish with a, with a protein, and then you add serum to different wells of the dish, 
and, and depending on whether there's a response or not, you'll get a very strong signal in some wells or no signal in other wells. The challenge, of course, with ELISA assays is that they're typically one protein at a time approaches, and they often require large amounts of purified antigen to run the, the assay. So the approach that we are uh, following uh, is a little bit different. Here, what we're doing is we're using a protein microarray. This is a microscopic chip that has thousands of spots on it, and each spot on that chip represents a different protein. We can then probe that array with serum, and wherever a spot lights up, as you can see on the right there, that is a spot where there's an antibody that recognizes that particular protein. Now, if you compare microarrays from a number of patients to a number of controls, you can look for those spots that specifically correlate with the illness you're interested in, and that's the approach we're taking. Now, of course, to get there, we needed to first build a library of genes that would allow us to make all the different proteins we wanted to test. Uh, and, and here, um, Joe Maselli, Mitch McGee, uh, Val Murrigan, um, and Jay Park have played a key role in developing a repository that we have at Arizona State University that we call FLEX. Uh, the goal here is to have every gene in it make these, we, we share all of these genes with anybody who wants them with no restrictions attached to them. They're all sequence of, uh, and they're all sequence verified. And so the concept here was, lots of individualized barcoded tubes with many different genes in it. And the reality looks something like this. We have a $2 million automated uh, minus 80 degree freezer um, that has um, tubes, and you can see them in the little um, blue square there on the right, that have 2D barcodes on the bottom of each tube. And those 2D barcodes indicates to our database which gene is in that tube. Um, to give you some flavor of what we have in our library, we now have cloned just, just about every human gene available. So we have 18,000 full-length human genes cloned, as well as large collections of genes from 54 different bacteria and 145 different human viruses that are all kind of listed here on this, on this slide. Um, and um, they're all available from our website, DNASU. You are all welcome to share them. We, we share them to anyone who asks. Uh, we, we've already delivered over 425,000 samples to 184 different countries and 48 states in the United States. So um, we've distributed these things pretty broadly now. So now to get back to how do we use those clones to make protein arrays, um, this is work that Nero Ramachandran and Jeannie Hainsworth pioneered in the lab with the help from some of the others listed on this slide. And the approach that we took um, uh, is a little bit different from the classic approach. What's shown here is the first published protein array. This is work by Gavin Macbeth when he was at Harvard. Um, here, here is shown the, the array. There are 10,000 features on that array and um, one tiny little red spot for the protein he was looking for. Now, the approach he took was to purify the proteins and then use a printer to spot the proteins on the glass slide, which is the approach most people take. The challenge there, of course, is that um, making those proteins is not always easy. So this first array, for example, only has two proteins, 9,999 spots of one protein and one spot of the other protein. If he wanted to do 10,000 different proteins, he would have had to purify 10,000 different proteins. And, and there are challenges attached to high throughput protein purification. Um, first of all, um, the yield you get varies over several logarithms. Uh, most of which is on the lower end. So you end up with not very much protein for most of your samples. And uh, of course, the concern is whether or not the proteins after you purify them and then print them and then store them printed remain well folded or whether they lose their natural conformation. So we, um, we came up with a different strategy uh, and it, we call it NAPA or nucleic acid programmable protein array for short. And the idea is that we print the cDNA for the protein on the chip. Uh, and then we store the chip as a cDNA chip. On the day of the experiment, we add a cell-free extract that does in situ transcription and translation, producing the protein directly on the chip, capturing it directly to the spot where it was printed um, with capture agents that we built in from the beginning. And, and, and there are some advantages to this approach. Um, uh, first of all, we don't need to do any protein purification. Uh, we only have to do DNA mini preps, and those are much easier to do than purifying proteins. Um, we get very consistent protein levels, as shown on this slide, 
Uh, virtually all of our proteins are within a single logarithm. They're all within tenfold. And in fact, about 93% of our proteins are within twofold of the mean. There are really no biases to the different types of proteins that we make. Um, and because we're um, using human ribosomes and human chaperone proteins to make our proteins, we, we find that they are well-folded and well-behaved. Um, it's relatively easy for us to make stable arrays. And of course, we don't have to worry about um, really to make custom arrays, and we don't have to worry about stability because we're making the proteins on the day that we're going to test them. So um, uh, one, one key uh, point that I want to make here is that in addition to making many different proteins, you can use this approach to look at different parts of proteins. If you want to map, for example, interaction domains. Here, one of our postdocs, Rodrigo Barderas, was mapping a P53 monoclonal antibody to the protein. He made a series of N-terminal deletions shown in green. He printed them on the array. And as you can see in the green box, you can see um, at which point the antibody stops binding, presumably because it's lost the epitope. He came in from the other side, the C-terminus with the lines in blue. And you can see again that um, it binds to a series of those fragments until it stops binding again, marking the other end of the, of the epitope. And then on the bottom there, on the lower left, he also took a series of tiling fragments made by PCR, produced those proteins, and he could find the one tiling fragment that contained the epitope. So in one experiment, he can map the epitope. So how does this all relate to cancer? Um, well, the, as I mentioned before, um, the goal here is to probe uh, a series of arrays with uh, from either cancer patients with serum from cancer patients or serum from control patients. And what we're looking for are the spots kind of highlighted in this slide in red. Uh, and these spots are, are specifically cancer specific spots that show up only in cancer patients. Um, this is what it looks like in actual practice. On the left there in green, you can see we've stained our array for DNA. That just shows that we printed the array evenly. Uh, next to it, you can see an antibody to the tag on the protein, in this case, a GST tag. And that gives us a sense of how much protein we're displaying over, overall in the array. And on the right, you can see serum from either patients or controls. And you can see where their spots are lighting up to indicate that the patient makes antibodies against that particular protein. Based, um, this is just to, 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 to demonstrate that when we do this experiment on different days, we get uh, the same result. So we take the same sample, repeat it on different days, and you can see that the, example, the, uh, the reproducibility is quite good. Um, I'm gonna skip this for time. Um, and then uh, a key element here is that by definition, if we have a positive hit on our protein arrays, because they were made from a plasmid making the protein, we have the plasmid to make the protein. We can take that plasmid and use it to develop our quick ELISA assay uh, which we can then apply to many, many more additional samples to, to do essentially validation studies for our biomarker to demonstrate that, in fact, that marker really is predictive of the presence of cancer. And we can typically get an ELISA for any protein using this approach set up in about two weeks. So um, for back to the breast cancer story, we did a, we did a, uh, a screen. We, we tested 50 women uh, with cancer against uh, roughly um, the same number of controls. Uh, initially, we tested around 5,000 antigens because back then that's all we had. Now we have much more. And uh, identified roughly 750 that had some potential difference. In a new set of samples and controls, we screened those and identified 128 antigens that looked like they were predictive. And then we did a third round, this time blinded to detect um, uh, any markers that held up after three rounds of, of, of testing and identified 28 biomarkers that um, had sensitivities ranging from 10% to 40% um, at 98% specificity. Uh, and those, that list is shown here. Um, uh, no single marker is typically any higher than 40%. That's pretty common for autoantibodies. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the disease, and that uh, manifests itself in very various responses. So um, those markers have since been licensed to um, initially to a company called Provista. Uh, Provista actually built that into a test called the Vedessa Breast uh, Diagnostic, which was CLIA certified, and they were 
uh, running um, clinical trials with that marker uh, and using it in the clinic um, for various uh, unrelated reasons to science, um, but Provesta is no longer uh, a company. Uh, and so the, the marker and that, that whole panel has been purchased by Totos Medical, which is now um, uh, developing the test for re-release later this year or early in Q1 of 2022. Okay, um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, this is, these are just some of the um, uh, clinical trial, prospective clinical trial results that they saw in women who have um, early stage um, uh, uh, questionable mammograms, basically um, uh, three, four, and fives, um, the, 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 uh, those are the women, and you can see at ages uh, under 50 and over 50, roughly what, what those numbers are. I think the main focus here is to look at the NPV, because um, one of the main goals of this test is to do it in conjunction with mammography and to rule out cancer um, uh, with, um, with the test for women who have questionable findings. Um, in light of the time, I'm going to, ref I'm going to skip over these um, a couple of slides here. And just mention that in addition to um, uh, looking at proteins displayed as sort of naked proteins, we're now developing technologies to look at proteins with protein post-translational modifications. Uh, this began with developing a, a high density technology where we etch tiny wells into silicon. Um, as you can see by the scanning EM at the top of the image here, uh, and then we can print our DNA into those wells and express our proteins. And then using that approach, and I'm gonna skip over these. Using that approach, we can then capture our protein on a cover slip that we add to the top of the slide, uh, remove, the, remove the cover slip now with the protein covalently attached to the surface, get rid of everything else that was in the extract that was used to make the protein, and we have a very clean covalently attached protein to a slide in a, in a microarray format that we can then treat with various enzymes to add uh, post-translational modifications. And I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. Uh, and then um, this is just to indicate to you uh, in a number of diseases, patients make antibodies to specific proteins that are post-translationally modified. So this happens to be rheumatoid arthritis where patients make antibodies against citrullinated proteins. You can see um, the two boxes on the left where the patients, uh, where the proteins were citrullinated on our arrays. You can see strong antibody responses. And then if you look under the native slide to the right where we did not add the citrulline, um, there is no immune response. So these immune responses are post-translational modification specific. Um, and I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time. Uh, this is just to point out that one of the areas where, glyco where modified proteins makes the most difference is in cancer. Um, uh, as many of you know, in, in the context of cancer, patients have very aberrant glycosylation of proteins um, in their systems. And all of these markers here are well-known cancer biomarkers and all of them are glycosylated proteins. So we thought it would be very useful to add um, a bit, the sugars to these two, two proteins in, a, in much in the same way that you see in this aberrant glycosylation on the arrays and then look to see if those aberrantly glycosylated proteins induce antibodies in a way that we can use to detect cancer. Uh, the, the aberrant glycosylation that occurs in cancer and we're looking specifically now at O-glycosylation is um, they tend to be truncated glycans, so you don't get the long complex chains that you would see in a healthy person. Rather, you end up with one, two, or three sugars at most, um, and they tend to be more prolific. So you, you, get, you get sugars added to uh, tyrosines and serines that are not normally um, modified. So you get sort of a more promiscuous glycosylation and sh shorter glycosylation. And so we can mimic that uh, on our arrays. Um, this is the development method that we did. We took uh, our proteins and expressed them on beads. Uh, and then using various glyc glycosyl transferases, we added sugars to these proteins and demonstrated that as shown on the mass spec to the right. 
Uh, and this is just sort of confirming that, you know, using various proteins, we could add the, the sugars. Uh, th this is different types of modification. This is core three modification. Uh, and then we took a series of proteins that are of interest to cancer. Uh, the O-glycoproteome, as Henrik Clausen has defined it, um, highly expressed proteins in cancer, uh, known biomarkers in cancer, and, and in particular, the mucins, which have been long studied as modified, modified glycosylated proteins specifically changed in cancer. And put, printed them all on an array. Uh, and then we're, we've now, we're now doing a clinical trial where we've taken 40 women with cancer and 40 women who don't. Um, uh, probed using their serum, probed arrays that either have unmodified protein or proteins with either TN, STN, or core three modified proteins. Uh, and looking to see if we can identify antibodies that are specific to the cancers. And we're, the preliminary data are shown here. Um, shown in these circles here are some proteins that are showing up only uh, after the protein's been modified with STN. You can see the antibodies don't bind to the native protein. Um, here is um, another example using core three. Um, again, the proteins circled in red circles um, are all showing antibodies in the context of core three. And then um, here's another example of core three where you can see very clearly strong responses to core three modified proteins that you just don't observe uh, against unmodified proteins in cancer patient serum. Um, we're doing the validation studies on this now. Um, this is the, um, uh, the overall study design. Uh, I mentioned the BIRADS um, three, four, and five there. Um, and those are the women that were actually, whose samples were actually testing. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, this is the, the group that does the work. Um, uh, I know we have a panel discussion coming up. Uh, so I have to tell you this picture was taken before COVID as you can tell. Um, we're, we're waiting for the chance to take another picture one of these days. Um, right now you wouldn't recognize anybody with their masks on. So um, I will stop here. Um, uh, if there's a quick question, I can take it now. Otherwise we can wait and, and go to the panel discussion. So if I see something crop up in the chat, I'll answer it quickly. Otherwise, I want to move on to Faud's talk. All right, well, let's move on to Dr. Atouf. Um, let me uh, pull, um, pull that up. Yeah, so Dr. Um, uh, Fouad Atouf is, uh, is the Vice President of Global Biologics for USP. Um, he got his PhD in cell biology from the Pierre and Marie Curie uh, University in France. Um, he, uh, he's a strong background in, in development of cellular and tissue-based products and uh, has been at USP for over 15 years in a variety of scientific leadership roles uh, and leads all of their scientific activities. So I'm going to hand it to him. Uh, his talk will be developing cell and gene therapies, challenges and opportunities. Thank you, Joshua. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. I also want to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak at the Riyadh Global Medical Biotechnology Summit. I will shift a little bit gears in my talk and discuss some of the um, you know, different type of therapeutic products, the cell and gene therapies. And throughout the talk, I'll be referring to those advanced therapies, but also cell and gene therapies. And I think just for the purpose of this discussion, I'll use the term interchangeably to, to, to capture the, the, the large family of products. Uh, in terms of scope and focus also, I will shift a little bit uh, from the two previous presentation, and the discussion is not going to be too technical. I will talk about the type of regulatory framework and analytical standards that can help advance this type of product to the patient. Um, I will start with an overview of USP strategic scientific approaches, then I'll share some of the challenges and opportunities related to the development of cell and gene therapy. And um, then I will, before I conclude, I will present some of the USP work and tools to support advanced therapy. The USP has evolved over the past 200 years, um, and, and the, the evolution in terms of um, standards um, adapted to new technologies and regulatory trends, our mission remains the same, and we continue to help with trust and the medicine that we take. Another view of the evolving role of USP and the standard is reflected on the, in the scope of those standards. So if you see to the left uh, is a copy from the initial pharmacopoeia in 1820, where uh, the scope was a description of pharmaceutical recipe. 
we evolved since then to sophisticated test procedures that can apply to specific products, such as heparin or insulin, but also classes of products, such as monoclonal antibodies or stem cell derived from blood. I'll be discussing some of those examples throughout the presentation. So when it comes to biological medicines, including cell and gene therapies, the, the strategy that we put in place is intended to enable implementation of cultural quality, um, enabling a cultural quality. And um, part of that is to ensure that quality is, is addressed throughout the product life cycle. We are focused on the development of analytical tools aligned with global norms. We develop tools that address qualification of raw materials used in bank fire manufacturing. Our work plan is developed through uh, early engagement with stakeholders and developing those solutions with them. Um, so in this context, we are allocating um, enough resources to work on cell and gene therapy products. So let's get started with some introduction for the cell and gene therapy type of product and, and, and therapy, just to make sure we are on, on the same page. A couple of examples that I put in this slide are an example of a gene therapy that consists of the introduction of an exogenous gene into a patient to correct the deficiency. It is enabled by the use of viral vectors such as adeno-associated viruses, virus or retroviruses. And gene therapy can also be achieved by using uh, crispr cas gene editing approaches. On the other hand, and that's what on the panel to, to the right, the cell therapy are using um, one of the, 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 the key player examples here as CAR-T, where you isolate T cells and where you introduce this engineered chimer receptor, and that allows the T cells when reintroduced back to the patient to identify tumor cells and start killing these cells. AAV mediating gene therapies and CAR-T are some of the key players in this field. That's why I use those as examples to get started with this discussion. You know, obviously advanced therapies still hold the promise to treat unmet medical needs, despite some of the challenges that are summarized on this page. Some of the key cha challenges uh, speak to the transfer of processes from an academic to clinical setting and the kind of scale, scale up that we need to do. Autologous products um, pose a, a unique challenge because they require uh, slightly different approaches for release testing. Advanced therapies in general uh, will require the use of novel and complex type of raw material. The regulatory pathways continue to evolve globally. And on the next slide, I'll be showing you uh, just one example of the approach taken by in the United States by the US FDA. So what you see here, and, and it's a high level summary of the US regulatory framework, the product can invest patient through different pathways. The so-called 361 HCTP product comply with pre tissue practices and they don't require pre-market review. The 351 type of product are regulated as biologics and in addition to the same requirement as for the 361 product, a pre-market review and authorization is required. This is the category we have where you have most of the cell and gene therapy product. Uh, some of the cell therapy products come through the device pathway uh, because of the type of manipulation, or maybe sometimes the combination of the device and cells and things like that. Also, um, there are ongoing development in the regulatory landscape, so it doesn't stop. So one example is the regenerative medicine uh, um, advanced therapy designation, which is uh, a path that allows for to bring this therapy faster to the patient, and it has some requirements. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I think really to talk about, continue the conversation around how science and regulation continue to evolve through guidance and guidelines from the other agencies, such as from the FDA, the European Medicine Agency. And with here, I, I must give you examples of guidance documents uh, from both agencies that focus on the chemistry manufacturing and control aspect. Uh, there are obvious scientific paradigms that continue to uh, um, advance and um, there are a number of organizations that have tried to tackle that, professional societies, alliances. A good example that I thought it would be worth mentioning here is the, the, the project by the Alliance for Medicine, but for, um, it's, it's, it's a book of knowledge on, on, on gene um, therapy or cell therapy 
and the gene therapy group is complete, the cell therapy group is in the development. The advanced therapies are also, um, you know, it is important to highlight this is a field where we continue to understand how we can evolve from academic research to industrial production. And also the line between the practice of medicine and the administration of the genetic product is not always clear. And this is why it's important to harmonize the immunology, uh, especially how we define advanced therapies. Uh, to that point, I, I listed here as a reference from the Saudi FDA. I really want to applaud our colleagues from the Saudi FDA for setting a good foundation for the classification of advanced therapy through the guideline that is shown on this website. I'm not going to go through it. You, you, have, you, can, you can review the guideline uh, at good leisure. It has a lot of information on uh, you know, how you define advanced therapies. Let's shift gears um, a little bit to talk about the tools and the standard that can help moving this product to the clinic. Some of the tools and standards are, that are needed uh, to advance the field relate to characterization and clinical testing, best practices and reference material uh, to support quality of raw materials that are used in manufacturing. A good example is plasma DNA. Uh, the need to have proper biological assays and guidance on how to develop those assays and to measure potency. Rapid microbial method is critical because for cell and gene therapy, uh, keep in mind this is short shelf life product and you can't afford to use uh, the, the traditional sterility assurance type of test. So those are like just examples that we collected throughout the years uh, by listening to stakeholders who work uh, around the USP states. Um, Continuing on a little bit, the challenges with standardization, and just to mention that unlike large molecules as math, the production of advanced therapies requires the use of complex, multi-step, multi-component manufacturing process with associated variability in raw material. Another challenge relates to evolving and standing of the critical quality attribute for cell and gene therapy. The diversity of cell type and patient uh, variability complicate uh, the, the broad-based standard development approach. Uh, I want to introduce um, how, um, you know, the work that USP does and, and, and show how it's complementary to regulatory guidance from the FDA, for example, here. Uh, while guidance documents can be applied to a wide variety of products, pharmacopial documentary standard can uh, be more detailed. And there are a couple of examples here and just one for showing side by side the FDA guidance uh, for cell therapy and then the US, the relative USP chapter on cell therapy. Same thing for um, gene therapy. Uh, what else is in the USP and F book of standard? A series of general chapters with best practices to product classes uh, or focused on raw materials used in manufacturing. An example is the general chapter 10.3 but also the specific chapter uh, on bovine serum as a key component in manufacturing, uh, 1024 and 90. Technologies can also be within the scope of standardization with an example for close activity as a key method for cell characterization. Some best practices in one of the general chapters, and I'll come back to a specific examples in a minute or two. So um, this slide is extracted uh, from the USP General Chapter 1046. It is intended to show examples of, of test procedures that can be used to address key quality attributes for cell-based therapy with focus on therapy assurance, identity, purity, and potency. To the right, you see some of the acceptance criteria for this uh, test. Because of the complexity of this product, sometimes more than one test will be needed to address a single quality attribute. And if you look at identity, you have a series of tests, and that's the concept of orthogonality that is used in biology in general, uh, where you need multiple methods to address the same attribute. Um, similarly, on the next slide, um, you know, similarly to cell therapy product, this practice in testing for gene therapy is presented in the USP chapter 1047 with a variety of tests depending on whether the gene therapy product is intended to be administered after introduction into cells or directly to uh, the patient using different types of uh, viral or non-viral vectors. When cells are used to deliver the gene therapy, the testing approaches will resemble what we discussed for the cell therapy product. 
I, I want to show this example of um, approach to standardization of tests that are critical to ensure uh, the, the, the quality of a cell therapy product. And this one relates to um, addressing a key attribute for when you use hematopoietic stem cell. As you know, the number of stem cells correlate with, um, with um, stem cells correlate with the engraftment of cells derived from bone marrow or fruit blood or other types of samples. And therefore, it is really important to count the cells with, um, in the samples with the highest accuracy possible. The method in USP chapter 127 describe a, um, a procedure for the enumeration of stem cells in different types of samples. It's a method that we validated that was developed by the International Society of Cell Therapy. And uh, we took that method, we validated, we also developed a reference standard to support qualification of the method, qualification of the reagent, uh, but also propagating strategies, because keep in mind for stem cells, we are looking for a raised population, that quadrant to the left, the upper left, has a, a little bit of a rare um, um, population that is uh, targeted for the type of measurement. Um, can I move now uh, to talk about upcoming uh, project for standardization that we're working on in collaboration with uh, different partners? And the few examples that I'm listing here are um, DNA, DNA standard to support the measurement of vector copy number when using like viral vector for cell, cell gene-based therapy. Example is CAR-T. So um, this is a test that uh, has implication on safety. So getting a, a good estimate of that is really important. So that work is undergoing right now. Another important viral vector used in cell gene therapy is the adeno-associated virus with different serotype and we're currently pursuing standards to allow the measurement of the ratio between the pool and empty capsule. For the mRNA-based therapy, we've done some work on mRNA in the context of vaccine mRNA. We have gained a lot of insight from that work, and we will leverage that to develop additional standards to support this type of, of, of therapy. And so those are just examples, and I'm just gonna move and lead to my last slide. To just conclude by saying that the control, um, the control of the um, of quality of incoming material processes and analytical methods will provide a framework for better consistency in manufacturing of cell gene therapy. Uh, at USP, we are committed to support the development of safe and effective therapies um, and deliver those to the patient. We work with stakeholders through different mechanisms such as workshops and tables. Uh, we, we, we work actually in regional platforms and we are a center of excellence for advanced therapies in the APEC region. And we're interested in exploring new collaboration um, in, in this space with different regions of countries. Uh, I look forward to further dialogue with the biotechnology professional in Saudi And I think, as I said, this is my last slide. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was a terrific presentation. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick call for anybody who has an immediate question that they want asked or an, uh, answered. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, all right. Well, if that's the case, we're going to probably just continue to move on um, uh, to the next presentation. Um, let me just get my... So this is... Um, our next presenter is Marcus Petersheim. Uh, uh, who is the managing director with Alvarez and Marcel in Frankfurt, um, uh, who lead healthcare and life sciences group in Germany. Um, he has served uh, three years as an interim CEO of Asta Medica Vitaris, uh, former pharma, it's a pharma division of Degusa and responsible for st uh, strategic blueprint to sell the business. Um, he has 25 years of experience in strategy development, execution of performance, improving consulting, as well as interim management in the healthcare industry. Uh, and um, he's deeply involved in the private equity sector. So we're very happy to welcome uh, Marcus Pedersheim and we'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, of course, after all this, this great science, um, I must take now the humble approach uh, to take you um, basically into the last mile. And that is bringing this innovation actually to the patient. So it needs to be manufactured. And um, uh, let us share some... Um, ideas and, um, and, and findings from, from project experience, how to create biotherapeutics CDMO hub. So basically starting off the uh, vision 2030 
um, and how it was spelled out for the health sector transformation program. Um, it says something about um, the benefit that, of course, uh, superior health services uh, would have for, for um, the population. And on the other side, um, it stresses the point of the principle of value-based healthcare. Of course, value-based healthcare uh, is something that is highly related to outcomes. Uh, and on the other side, cost-efficient provision uh, of such therapies. And we are talking biologics here when I see, uh, say, CDMO, so contract development and manufacturing organizations, is like dealing with biosimilars and those things that might come um, as, at the moment of innovation at very high prices and then uh, can be put into a cost-efficient way uh, to reduce it for local markets, uh, for the region, um, and as such. Moving forward, actually, into, uh, into the region, um, the healthcare market itself um, is, is actually here a growing opportunity. Um, and um, over the recent years, there has been quite some effort to, to build supreme um, infrastructure of healthcare provision. Um, and uh, looking at the drug market alone, um, the, uh, the market uh, is expected to grow significantly over the next couple of years, making it, of course, with all the innovation that we discussed throughout the course of the day, uh, a prime uh, market for bringing biologics actually here uh, in, a local, in a local setting. So we heard a lot about um, the, the, the circumstances and the, uh, um, actually the setting uh, in, in which we are looking to, to actually inject um, uh, biologics, uh, be it biosimilars or biotherapeutics. Uh, of course, um, the whole complex and that we have seen in, in other um, um, uh, growing and, and existing um, stable economies, we have an aging population, we have a high prevalence of lifestyle diseases, and on the other side, um, uh, cancer taking its, uh, uh, its, its way into, into the population, seeing, uh, for instance, here, um, um, quite, quite a significant increase if you go uh, with the WHO numbers uh, until 2040. So there is need for, for cost-efficient treatment of such diseases. When, uh, when you look into what's, what's in the potential pipeline when you talk about biosimilar opportunities, there are a lot of advanced treatment biologics um, that will play an important role in this uh, uh, in this fight against uh, those diseases I just um, highlighted. And in, uh, uh, in this table, you would find um, biologics that go into a broad variety of, uh, of medical indications. You would find um, uh, biosimilars going into, or biologics going into uh, fields like uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, or you have uh, severe asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, or even uh, age-related uh, macular de de degeneration. So it is a broad set of applications and a broad set of, um, um, of molecules that could potentially be brought um, and, and produced locally. As we heard, of course, um, this, uh, the, the production of biologics is not something where you think about um, global supply chain and you don't want to, to ship around um, uh, complex molecules and complex cold chains around the globe. So um, there is virtue actually in having uh, a local hub that can produce uh, very complex molecules. And uh, um, when we talk about complex molecules, um, like, like what's depicted here, like in Herceptin, with more than 25,000 atoms, um, that, that is something that goes far beyond the capabilities of just erecting a pharmaceutical site which is small molecule or medium-sized molecule. It, de it definitely needs a complete um, different set of capabilities. And just alluding a little bit to this, um, you would have everything uh, from DNA sequencing, uh, over cloning and cell expansion, um, the, the cell production, um, then everything that goes into isolation, so centrifugation, deep filtration, purification methods, con concentration and formulation. So, and there is um, a multitude of, of differences in, in each and every step, so that uh, in, in the beginning, you need to carefully consider what is it that you're going to, um, going to produce? What is your pipeline? Because what you erect now um, is, is something that uh, cannot be frequently changed each and every second year if, if there is another, uh, another set of molecules coming. So um, have a good strategy um, upfront, 
um, and a good pipeline management um, to then erect something um, that is capable of producing um, those um, molecules and those, those, um, those medications and biologics uh, that deal with significant uh, medical burden uh, in the target markets. But what does that really mean? Um, so there isn't a lot you can learn from, from running, for, uh, for instance, a typical small molecule plant. Um, you have to have uh, real mastery and, and compliance in a wide, uh, wide field of activities. And uh, you need to manage microbial uh, production, viral vectors, DNA production. Um, you uh, may want to consider um, and, and, and run uh, excellence in containment operations. You have to guarantee uh, a cold chain with all the documentation that goes along with it. To then later on uh, think about steer out fin uh, fill and finish, that could everything be uh, like a pre-filled syringe or an ampoule or a vial, um, depending on, on how you want to administer it, uh, what kind of provider you're targeting, uh, alongside with the quality controls and quality management. Um, with everything um, and, and serialization, for instance, is the easiest, uh, the easiest piece to it. But the documentation of a cold chain, complete storage, transportation uh, documentation is really something that requires a lot of attention. Um, things specific to biologics, cell banking for qu uh, quality control purposes and for, um, for um, production purposes. Uh, and last but not least, you're handling uh, a lot of data here. Um, everything that deals with cybersecurity. Uh, you don't want to have um, uh, inroads of um, um, uh, potential intruders um, in, in your recipes, in your manufacturing processes, which is uh, largely, largely automated. So creating this full service biologic CDMO, after we heard um, of the, the great innovation potential uh, internationally and here in the region, seems to be a quite logical step um, to bring the scientific excellence actually into the region. And um, um, the question, of course, is how far do you want to go and how far do you want to back integrate into research and development um, and, and how far you want to go um, for, for end market readiness, so even going into packaging. But if you just go through this, this list of what typically is done uh, in the development area uh, where we produce the API, we do the formulation, um, it needs a whole uh, um, and quite comprehensive um, uh, master plan to actually make sure that everything is in place that you need for such a, uh, for such a uh, endeavor. And that means everything up to a stable utility supply, so electricity, gray water, white water, um, that you have uh, uh, sufficient logistics capabilities, warehousing, um, um, uh, manufacturing um, equipment that is highly versatile, um, and of course, on top, the continuous flow of, um, uh, of pipeline products out of the biologics uh, scene. So, but if you build such a CDMO, where does it take you? Um, do you want to compete in the international market and is there really a chance to do so? Of course, within each and every industry, and it's no, no different in CDMO, the market has a couple of, uh, of elephants on top, like the, um, the, uh, the Catalans and Lonzas of this world, with different um, uh, kinds of approaches towards biologics. Um, the bigger the companies, uh, the more it's necessary. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, smaller companies in this, uh, in this space who have discovered, uh, of course, the changes uh, from smaller molecule to larger molecule, focusing on providing uh, platforms for, for innovative biotechnology companies to bring their products to market. So um, there is opportunity to create definitely a local champion for, uh, for biotech manufacture. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, it also um, furnishes a great opportunity to either partner and or acquire targets uh, for speed and to, to um, uh, transfer technologies um, out of a group context, which might help you uh, to overcome building everything from, uh, from a scratch perspective. So, um, like with every plan, um, you can learn from others. Uh, you don't really have to start really from scratch. Um, um, but what is of the essence is, at a certain point in time, you just need to kick it off. Um, and when you look at 
recent examples of how large, um, large players in the CDMO field have tackled the, the area uh, of, of, um, of biotech. You would see, for instance, Lonza having invested over $700 million um, dollars, uh, to ramp up um, one of their Swiss sites in FISP with five state-of-the-art manufacturing complexes. And the interesting thing here is um, it is so um, variable and versatile, not only in the, in the, in the setup of these buildings uh, where companies can come in and do everything from, um, uh, from, from uh, uh, early stage production up to fill and finish, uh, they only they, they even had thought about um, uh, different operating models. So you can basically get full service. So someone operates such a facility um, up to the point where you can buy it um, or lease it or rent it. And um, so this is a new set of capabilities that international CDMOs are pushing forward. And given um, uh, the region's um, financial resources, it could very well be an attractive model uh, to learn from when it comes to operating models um, and attracting international companies to, um, uh, to KSA. Cataland, uh, on the other side, um, uh, invested uh, over $100 million um, um, dollars in, in an expansion program for the Italian plant, uh, putting in some highly versatile single-use bioreactors and the, uh, the corresponding infrastructure. So, um, long story short, this just depicts um, that a lot is happening in this market. And if you really um, uh, are fast to create uh, a front runner, uh, that company could have um, quite, uh, quite a good position serving the region and serving even uh, across the region. So getting started, and this, this is the most difficult part. When we, when we work with our clients, um, it always comes to a master plan where you need to choose where to build it, what to build, how to build, and how to mitigate risks uh, on, on the way to, um, to actually getting the plant up and running. You start with a complete assessment of the business environment. Um, and um, the general mindset behind this um, is that you need to provide something that is easy to do business with. So you don't want to create something that is overboardingly uh, administrative. So you have supportive governmental processes in there. You have a pro-business environment. Uh, you, you attract and, and welcome foreign investment, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, that directly leads into, uh, into the second uh, group of um, decision criteria. These are the risk factors. So is there any risk of business disruption, uh, macroeconomic risk and financial stability? Big things when, when you think about, for instance, uh, moving, um, moving into, into Eastern Europe, for instance, um, is there a stable currency? Um, and uh, how about cybersecurity, uh, natural disaster risk? So these, these kind of things um, uh, sound quite um, trivial, especially after this great display of, uh, of high-end um, research this morning. But uh, these more profaneous um, kind of decisions that you need to, to take um, and take action um, actually help to bring such an idea to, um, um, to real life. Regulatory environment. We heard uh, from just from uh, um, Dr. Atu, uh, the uh, from the pharmacopoeia. The regulatory environment, of course, is highly complex for biologics. So you need to to uh, understand it, attract talent, and, and have people in here um, that really know how to to run the show in a in a way that uh, um, that uh, regulatory compliance is uh, is an absolute given. But it goes into other areas as well. So everything that goes with the environmental protocol, that goes into the tax environment, all these things um, can have quite some influence on decision making, where to go and how to go, and whether or not you can attract, for instance, uh, international cooperation partners. Next to that, providing the infrastructure. I already mentioned um, uh, what really makes a suitable site. Uh, it's not just the real estate that there is land, um, but is the site ready uh, for, for, uh, for getting started? Um, how do you want to configure your building and the overall site? Do you have the required um, utilities and infrastructure already, uh, already there? Um, can you expand? And what are neighboring uses? You just don't want to put it next to, um, to certain industries and you don't want to have it near, uh, near a residential area. All these things uh, need to be considered 
when you uh, look for the right, uh, the right place to build such a, uh, such a facility. And last but not least, and we heard it already today, the supply chain setup. So first of all, if you want to build such a site locally, um, is there a proximity and reliability of the supply base that is needed to actually build it? Of course, you can, can, uh, can buy a factory more or less uh, complete engineering and even a turnkey um, kind, of, uh, kind of contract, but you don't really want someone from Switzerland or from the US each and every time going in when you do uh, overhaul maintenance. So you need to, to uh, have a local ecosystem of capable suppliers um, that can, can actually um, help you run um, stable operations. Then the next thing is the suppliers that are required for the operating, uh, for the operating um, uh, site, that, uh, to operate the site, which means um, that later on, you need providers for excipients, you need providers for, um, for glass packaging, all these things that need to be secured. Um, if there is proximity, even better. Um, but even this whole sourcing process needs to be thought through early on. Import tariff systems and processes. Um, we have dealt with, with countries and, and uh, pharmaceutical sites to be placed in there um, where you spend longer um, having things sitting in, uh, in customs quarantine than uh, actually on the active shelf life of a, of a product later on. You don't want to have these things. Um, that goes along with efficiency and availability of ground and air transportation through third party logistics um, to operate a cold chain uh, in a reliable way. That's then the network approach um, that needs to, be, uh, needs to be in place. And last but not least, um, you definitely need to think about resourcing. So um, is there enough available technical staff uh, that can run such an operation, um, management resources? Uh, is the workforce scalable in a certain, uh, in a certain area up to the point uh, where it is, is it attractive for expatriates? What, what kind of infrastructure would they expect to bring really the, uh, the best and the brightest um, uh, to, this, uh, to this place uh, to make this a success. Um, taking all this into account, I think it shows um, there are multiple topics to be addressed, um, but they have to be addressed in sync. And what does that mean? Uh, it should not be a planning exercise um, in, um, uh, in pillars um, and uh, disjunct from each other. So that needs to be synced up um, and um, developed in a way that there is a cohesive agenda. And so um, this is what we usually, um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, talk with our clients. At the, you need to take action. It's nothing um, better than having a good plan, but it's even better if, it's, uh, if it really hits the ground running. And that means start now, um, get the implementation plan up and running, be in sync, uh, involve all the required stakeholders. First things first, um, that, that is one of the most important things. Sounds easy, but it isn't. Um, so concentrate really on the main burden. Incentivize IP. Um, so um, just foster um, the attitudes towards um, local innovation ecosystems, build partnerships, and at the end of the day, be fast in whatever you do, uh, where you can help organizations to to actually establish here, speed really is critical. Um, be easy, so simplify your processes. Um, uh, some of us will remember the efforts of um, uh, the good old Höchst in Germany when they wanted to do this inhalable insulin. Uh, they fought for, uh, for a decade and finally lost it and put it somewhere else. So if you start with processes like this, uh, you will never attract um, and, and establish the right player. Last but not least, be agile. Do not allow perfection to be the enemy of progress. Um, we heard so many great things. Don't let, um, uh, let innovation pass you by uh, because you're not easy to do business with. And with this pledge, I would come to an end and uh, say thanks for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of you. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job. We started about 15 minutes late and we're exactly where we should be based on that. So. Uh, I think the speakers did a terrific job of uh, sort of sticking to their time. So I want to uh, appreciate that for everyone. I think what we'll do, since we're now moving into uh, uh, the intention is to do the panel discussion, is let's just move directly into that. Um, I, will, uh, I do want to briefly mention that we have one more uh, uh, scientist uh, joining us. This is, and I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm not going to get your name right, Valdemar Rajewski. Um, That's good. 
Okay, uh, who's the executive medical director for global clinical development at Amgen, um, uh, he, where he works in, on biosim biosimilars in California. He has 20 years of leadership roles in, in uh, pharma, uh, ranging from Merck and Janssen uh, uh, and Sandoz. Uh, he has an MD and a PhD from Jagiellon University uh, Medical College in Krakow, Poland, and um, uh, uh, trained in anatomical and clinical pathology. So another physician among us. So um, he's gonna join us, everybody else you've already heard about. So let's um, go ahead and open up the panel discussion. I wanna encourage people to put questions in the chat, uh, which is where we will get questions from. Uh, we, uh, we already got one, um, uh, and, and Fouad, why don't you go ahead and say it yourself since uh, you're already on, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Marcus. That's a great framework for, um, you know, how you can lead for, to biologics. Um, what, one of the questions I am asking myself is while you're doing that, would you envision moving from a traditional paradigm where you use like a plant-based manufacturing, you use like, the, uh, you know, a batch manufacturing to something like continuous manufacturing for biology, but also the use of disposable equipment has got a lot of traction uh, is this part of what you're proposing, or uh, are you focused more on like a, a traditional paradigm that you know establishes plant and manufacturing uh, phases? You see, that that's exactly uh, the great question that I hoped for, <laughs> because at the end of the day, you, you need to to really start thinking about what kind of uh, what kind of products do you do you really want to bring to the market in what sequence, um, and as of course, as soon as it allows for. Uh, a more continuous process kind of environment, or like the model that we have seen for uh, with, with Cataland uh, on single use uh, single use um, uh, equipment. Um, these questions need to be um, answered first, um, and and this this is um, where you immediately uh, will, will come to the idea: is it more the classical approach, or is it more the highly versatile kind of um, uh, kind of setup? I would always go for the latter, um, but it really depends. Um, do you go through, a, uh, let's say, a learning loop, or do you want to leapfrog into the latest and greatest with some of the risks attached to it? Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, I, so I'll, I'll jump in with a question unless I see something on the uh, uh, um, chat here. But so, um, so for, for Fouad, I, I'm sort of interested, um, you know, because of the whole regulatory thing strikes me as extremely complex in the context of an international, you know, yeah, international management. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you even approach that? I mean, uh, do you start with one country and then work your way through others? Or do, do you have charts of how different, different countries manage their regulatory requirements? What, what's, what, what's the approach that one takes to, to manage all that? You're muted. Oh, yeah, there you go. yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. You know, I, I always think of um, the word reliance. Um, so reliance means don't, don't try to reinvent um, guidelines and documents to create a framework for regulating product. Look at what's out there and, and for biologics, and we can look at uh, large molecules like monoclonal antibodies and proteins, and, and because there are a lot of biosimilar target there, I think there is enough, in my opinion, there's enough guidance from ICH, International Council for Harmonization, uh, the World Health Organization, and then uh, some of the major regulatory agencies have already advanced and with, um, you know, Europe actually over um, 65 or more actually by small on the market, the US over 25, 30, and then um, India actually much more, I think, but the definition of bison is different. But the point is, I think if, if you look at those guidance from the different regions and um, create a framework, use the resources for something that has not been covered by other agencies will be, in my opinion, a smart choice if you don't have that in place. And you could, for example, spend more resources on how you assess clinical data, uh, because that's maybe something you still want to do uh, locally, because you, 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 uh, you, you need to test um, you know, the population look at it to make sure that uh, the data that, that, that you get from the clinical uh, research is meaningful to your population. So, so I think it's, 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 um, it's, it's probably straightforward, in my opinion, for uh, 
recombinant proteins and things like that. But as you go to complex product, like the one I discussed, the cell engine therapy, it's, 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 a, it's a matrix of, of component and elements that make the product. It's a little bit more challenging. And one of the, the issues there, and that's why I really like that approach by the Saudi FDA, because you need to define actually where is the line between the practice of medicine and uh, making a regulated product that goes to, to the market. So I think it depends on the product, what, what, what you can do, but I hope that answers your question, uh, you know, as, at least as a first shot at it. Yeah, that's great, thank you. All right, we'd look to see. Um, it's, okay, we have a, 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 Hip, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? So I have a question to Dr. Tran. Um, how, how do you view immunogenicity potential of your fusion molecules as compared to, let's say, hum, f fully human monoclonal antibodies in humans? Um, it's so common like antibody actually is uh, in current Clinton trial shows very low immunogenic. Um, and uh, they also can be humanized, actually. Um, the, the approved FDA, they can humanize. It's similar, like you uh, switch the framework from overcoming like heavy chain to the human. And, and they, they relatively well packaged, so normally it's, it's not issue. It may be, I would say, similar to what other humanized antibodies. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I have a question to Marcus because let's say that uh, people produce uh, Herceptin user one cell, cell line like a CHO something. Mm -hmm. Now other company won't try to reproduce Herceptin as my similar. Do they have to use uh, the CHO or they can use other cell line or they can use like a humanized is uh, PCR pastries? Uh, if they change the host, then then how how you know, validate to be sure that you are same biologics. Because at the end of the day, um, it's very complicated. I, I'm, yes, um, it, it actually is. And I, I must admit, uh, being a chemist by education and not a regulatory expert, um, we would definitely have to go uh, go after this. So when, when we, um, when we um, uh, would define the portfolio of products, uh, of course, the route of um, how to actually get to such a product needs to be defined uh, and needs to be regulatory safe. Um, and uh, um, I, I would say at the moment, um, I can't answer that question, but it is exactly these things that need to be answered before you actually start to, to, uh, to actually take the first brick in hand. Can I comment on that? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I think it, it's a very good question. Ideally, you would use the same cell line because um, you want the same black regulation pattern, which is critical for therapeutic protein. Uh, but sometimes you are aware of the cell line, but not the subclone, because the cell line is what is publicly available, a clone, a specific clone that is used to, make, to produce the, the, the protein may not be known. I think you address that because the first step in biosimilar development is you take the reference uh, product or the product from the innovator company and you characterize it and you determine your critical quality attributes. And once you have that, then you start uh, you know, the work with the cell line. So what you need is a cell line or a subclone that allow you to produce something that is similar to those quality attributes that you were able to determine by characterizing the reference product. Great. Okay. Well, with, with that, I think um, uh, we're getting the nod. I think it is time to sort of wrap up our panel. I really appreciate the outstanding presentations that all of you have done and for being so good about sticking on time. So um, this is, uh, this, as you know, the Section 5 Biosimilars and Biotherapeutics Development and Manufacturing. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've covered everything from some, you know, early scientific approaches that may be useful uh, and eventually find their way into biosimilars to the important regulatory environment that uh, you have to operate in. And then uh, a very interesting discussion on how you then operationalize all of that by building facilities to actually manufacture all this stuff. So um, some very useful information for from all different angles. And I really appreciate that. So um, have a great afternoon for those of you who are on that part of the planet. And for those of me, I'm gonna head off to my morning. Uh, good, good meeting all of you and hope to see you all in future meetings. Take care.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Enjoy your morning, uh, Dr. Joshua. Thank you all uh, uh, for you and your esteemed panelists for uh, sharing with us your insights and views, focusing on the improved understanding of biotherapeutics and biosimilars that will undoubtedly enhance the lives of humans and global ecosystem. Such an interesting session. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin 30 minute uh, break. A quick reminder, you can follow the conversation of our sessions on Twitter um, at RGMBS2021 and also participate in the discussion by using the hashtag RGMBS2021. We would love to hear from you, so share with us your feedback and view. We'll be back at 7, 10 p.m. We have time for the last session, an interesting one. Stay connected. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.